Welcome to the Speckled Truth Podcast. This is the only show dedicated to the conservation of the trophy trout population from the East Coast to the Gulf Coast. Here, we go below the surface to discuss what happens when science and anglers work together for a cause. Gear up with your host, Captain Chris Bush, a trophy trout purist, leader and educator within the fishing community, as he talks about all things big speckled trout. Get ready for the slimy, salty truth, better known as the speckled truth. Hey everyone, I want to welcome you back to the Speckled Truth Podcast. Captain Chris here with uh, Mr. Keith Nuttall uh, from the Virginia area. Sir, good morning. Good morning, Chris. Glad to be with you. Absolutely. I appreciate you participating in the show. And honestly, I was just telling you a few minutes ago, you've come highly regarded and people want to hear from you. People definitely want to hear from you, especially through obviously your citation process and your, and your, and your productivity. But aside from that, how you catch or perpetually catch consistently those big, big trout. So uh, go ahead and if you don't mind, sir, tell a little bit about uh, yourself. Well, I'm 65 years old, and I grew up in uh, Gloucester, Virginia, and that's where I've lived my whole life. I've uh, built several homes with uh, my wife, and I've stayed within eight miles of where I grew up. I grew up uh, in Ware Neck, which is a neck of land on the Mobjack Bay, which is a, a estuary of the Chesapeake Bay, which is a, um, more toward the lower part of Chesapeake Bay. And... Um, my father was a big influence um, when I was growing up. Uh, I started, uh, I, I never uh, got into any sports, but I was always in the river. I was, uh, I had salt water in my veins. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I just, uh, I started fishing at a young age with my father. When he did have time, he worked a lot, but he did have time. And uh, I was the youngest of four siblings. And uh, he had a passion for fishing. We even did commercial fishing, gill netting. And uh, I always rake clams, oysters, uh, catching. So crab. you're a true, you're a true waterman. I mean, you've literally grown up on the water uh, from a very, very, very young age. Yes, I, I grew up about 400 yards from the water. I used to walk <laughs> down, a, <laughs> I used to walk down a, uh, a dirt road uh, to a friend's house and fish from the bank when I was a child. I would go out and uh, you know, 10, 11 years old, and dip up my peel of crabs. At, at low tide, and then uh, once the tide came in, I would uh, I would fish from the bank and uh, and catch uh, striped bass and speckled trout, and that was 10, 11, 12 years old. So I, I've been chasing speckled trout for about fifty three years now. On the oh chest- my god! And I was gonna I was gonna ask you. I mean, do you have basically one of those, or do you have a fish that you specifically remember? You say, you know what? I really speckled. There's something about speckled trout fishing or speckled trout that differentiates itself from any other species. Do you have any sort of specific experience that that happened to you where trout, it's either trout or nothing else? Yeah. Speckled trout. Um, I, I fish for a lot of different species, um, but speckled trout is my passion. Um, like I say, I started fishing for them at a very young age. Uh, I caught my first one from the bank. I was actually fishing by myself. And I, I took it. It wasn't a very big one. It was in May of uh, probably 1967, 68. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was probably about a 16 inch trout. And I took it to my father. I didn't know what it was because we were catching a lot of striped bass uh, back in those years. And uh, I took it to my uh, father that afternoon. And uh, when he got home from work and had it in, in, the, in the cooler, and he said, That's a salmon trout. That's what the old folks used to call mm-hmm. them, salmon trout. <laughs> and, uh, that was my uh, my first. I thought it was such a beautiful fish, uh, uh, and like I say, I fish for a lot of different species. I've fished in Cabo San Lucas. I giant mm-hmm. in tunas. I fish marlin tournaments, but my passion is uh, fishing at home uh, for speckled trout, and I've been doing that, like I say, for about fifty three years. And so, when did you like? When did you specifically get into targeting like big fish? Well, I, I caught big fish back in the seventies. I had, uh, I had three, you know, three 10 pound class fish. The largest was 10, 12, uh, about a 33 inch, uh, big, uh, female, uh, getting ready to spawn, uh, 32 and a half, 33 inch. That's, that's the largest I've ever caught as far as weight. Okay. And those years I had some more that were nine, 12, nine, five, eight, 14. That were all, you know, 30, 31, 32 inch fish, uh, depending on the time of year I caught them. So uh, 
targeting big trout is 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 just it's just been a passion. Um, I would like to also say that uh, uh, my career, uh, I started with the Virginia Marine Resources Commission in 1975. I was 20 okay. years old. I was one of the youngest uh, Marine police officers back that that time, and the VMRC. Uh, enforces all the laws relating to the marine resources of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I, uh, I became, that was my career for 33 years. So okay. I've always been on the water. Um, I ran a 31-foot Bertram on the lower bay enforcing the marine laws. I retired in 08. Um, okay. And um, I got to see, I got to check a lot of fishermen back those days all over the bay, the lower bay. And I got to see a lot of coolers, you know, of course, checking, you know, checking people's fish. It was, uh, VMRC officers are like the fishing game or Department of Natural Resources in other states, and that was my career. So uh, I was, I've always been on the water, and it's just, uh, like I say, I have salt water in my veins. And mm-hmm. uh, So that's, uh, I mean, so getting ready, like, or, or enforcing marine standards and, and checking people's ice chests and, and things of that nature, I mean, what, do you have, like, a specific, time when you were like that's the biggest trout i've ever seen is there a certain event or or a specific fish that you distinctly remember like that is the biggest trout i've ever seen and how big uh, was it back in the 70s uh, i had a friend that, ca- that caught one that was 13 12 13 <laughs> pounds per yeah. and a lot of people don't realize you know when i talk about you know the big big fish in texas and everything is big in texas but virginia yeah. had the, the uh, world record hook and line speckled trout from about 19, I think it was called in 1976 or 77. That it was, was 77. Huge. So I actually have it, I have it pulled up right here on my phone because okay. I was doing some uh, pre-show research. And so I'd always posted this actually uh, here and there, but give me one second. I'm looking at it and it is speckled trout. There it is. It's 16 pounds, Mason's Beach, 1977, Bill Cat Catco. Catco, that's right. I, I okay. didn't know him. I didn't know him. And I heard that fish was caught from the beach. Uh, he actually wasn't okay. in the boat. And I heard it was caught on a, a fillet of bluefish. That's, oh, wow. That's what I have heard over the years. How long was that fish? Do you remember? I think the fish was about 36 inches. Really? So that's actually pretty small in terms of like length because I saw one that was in the citation data, which we'll get into in a little bit. I think it was like in 2001 or 2002, the Virginia citation report that they have and they post out there, they had one fish. It was 37 inches and it, but it was only like eight and a half pounds. It was crazy how that must've been the longest skinniest fish, but good God. So 36 inches, 16 pounds. That's uh, I'm not positive a, about that, but I would say that was, uh, I would guesstimate 36, 37 inches. Um, goodness gracious. In, in the month of May, these big fish, they have so much girth on them. They're full of mm-hmm. rope. Um, the big females come in the bay and, uh, in these rivers and spawn, uh, the bigger ones start spawning in May. And that's usually the, the heaviest they are. And of course, a lot of people don't realize this, but speckled trout are batch spawners. They don't spawn all their eggs at one time. They, um, uh, they, they drop eggs like, you know, maybe some this week and some maybe two weeks later, and they spawn for several several weeks, even up to several months, uh, mm-hmm. May, June, July. And uh, even a 12 or 13-inch trout does spawn yeah. less than a year old. So that's yeah. uh, it's pretty neat that Mother Nature that, you know, allows them. And I guess it's, uh, it's more for the survival of the species. They don't drop all the eggs at one time for environmental factors or whatever that you, you know, that they can keep, you know, they can come back pretty fast. Yeah. That's, pr- and, and they are an incredibly resilient species and, and one that's just, uh, honestly amazing. So when I had Angela Cepedos on the podcast a couple episodes ago, he's a hatchery manager from Mississippi Gulf coast research lab. And he was talking about that. And I think we did like a post show type deal where that night they actually had, a spawn in their hatchery from a, a group of fish in the, in the, in the, in the fish, in the hatchery, excuse me. And what they were, so I, basically the question I had for him was what's the survivability of those eggs in terms of fertility and everything else. And he said, we actually had a 94% fertility rate wow. for those eggs in that. And, it, and the reason they do that is they run a skimmer 
So all the eggs that are in there, if they're not fertilized, they'll sink. But if they're not fertilized or if they're fertilized in like the first couple minutes, they basically, st- or if they're not, they'll sink. If they are, they'll continue to float, but okay. they only have a couple minutes for that to happen. So it's, it's truly remarkable, man, like how, uh, resilient and, and how kind of dialed in these, these fish are these in terms of reproduction, you know, it's, it's pretty insane, but it definitely makes sense. And, and, I, you know, I've always heard that growing up is that springtime is obviously when, it, when those fish are going to really pack on those pounds and that weight, yes. you know, in terms of row and girth and everything else. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, biggest trout you've ever caught though, was what uh, a little over 10 pounds, 10 pounds, um, 12 ounces, 10 pounds, 12 ounces. How many double digit fish do you have, sir? I Just- only have two, but I have a lot that were, you know, I, I probably caught, uh, in my lifetime, probably 20 fish over 30 inches. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> and I, I probably caught over 200 Virginia citations, which are either 24 inches for release or either a five pound fish. So, okay. So, yeah. So let's, let's, let's kind of transition to that. So talk to people. So I run the citation program for the dirty 30 citation. We run a state trophy trout citation program and the state ones for 27 inch trout and above. We'll send you a sticker right. for the dirty 30. Obviously it's a 30 inch fish and we'll send you a sticker as well as a dirty 30 citation sticker along with like a box of goodies. But the reason I started this whole deal was because of um, looking at and kind of being enamored by North Carolina and Virginia's citation program and, and kind of what that was after. So if you look at my spreadsheet, it's actually modeled after the one from Virginia. So if you can, though, give people a little bit of a background about the citation program in Virginia and kind of what it's about and in uh, how, how you can participate. Okay. It's, um, it started, uh, I believe, in 1957. I think this is... Wow. 63rd year. Um, wow. I didn't know it was that old. Crazy. Yeah, okay. Started in 1957. I think this tw- uh, 2020 is the 63rd year. Uh, it is the Virginia saltwater fishing tournament. That is the name of it. And uh, actually what the first uh, director of it was uh, Mr. Claude Rogers. Mm-hmm. He was a personal friend of mine. Of course, he was like 25 years older than I am. He's, he's deceased. Uh, he was my father's age. And he's, mm-hmm. he's been deceased for a few years, but he was the original one that started it. And it came under the Department of Tourism for Virginia. And uh, he was the, uh, the, the start of it. And he was the, uh, the brainstorm. And it came out with a very attractive uh, laminated plaque. Okay. Once you, and they had way stations, uh, you know, situated throughout, you know, tide water and, uh, you know, the, the water, the water. Um, the, you know, the waters of the Commonwealth that were uh, mm-hmm. accessible to people to go and weigh their fish. Um, and, and that's, and that's, it's pretty well been, hasn't changed, uh, you know, since, since those years. In fact, the plaques, uh, the boats and things and uh, the picture on the plaque uh, are still are really, uh, really go back to the, to the, you know, the late fifties when it started. So the original, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, it's a very nice, attractive uh, plaque, and uh, they've also done some other things. They've had uh, some other parts of the program, but like I say, it was on the Department of Tourism and Economic Development for Virginia, and that's that that's how it started. Okay, it's no it's no uh, charge to get in. You just have to take your fish if it's caught, you know, uh, on by hooking hooking by rod and reel, you know, recreational. If mm-hmm. it's caught, um, you just take the fish to the weigh station. And back those years, everything was, you know, was weighed, you know, you had to kill the fish, uh, mm-hmm. you know, until about, I think it's been about 15 or 20 years ago, they started having, they might have started, you know, the releasing part on a lot of the species like marlin and things like that, but the fish like that, even before that, but they started adding a lot of different species that you could get a release citation for the minimum length. And that, that's a really good part of the program. Um, Mr. Rogers was a personal friend of mine. I've actually uh, fished with him for uh, for Trophy Red Drum on the eastern shore of Virginia back mm-hmm. years ago, and we speckled trout fish some the last few years before he he uh, he, uh, he he died. Mm-hmm. Um, it's now part of the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, the agency that I work for now. It's uh, okay. It's, it's no more no longer part of that other uh, the Department of Economic and uh, Tourism, but. Um, 
so how do you, like how do you how do you win? Is there a winner? There's no uh, winner. You, there's no winner. Uh, you just get a plaque. Um, okay, so it's just an acknowledgement of yes. participating. In, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I was reading, and so I was reading a little bit about it um, on the site itself, and I believe all the plaque citations are sent out in like a certain month, and they were kind of talking about obviously what's going on right now in our world and how that's going to probably impact a little bit of how they deliver that. And, um, but on the same token as they were saying, uh, how many plaques are sent out? So, I mean, cause if you catch, let's say seven or eight fish that are citation worthy, they'll send you one plaque, right? But they'll yeah. also acknowledge the amount of citations that you had in that single year. Is that correct? Yes, that's okay. what works. Um, if you, you know, like, let's say you, uh, you just release all your fish and you've released eight for that year, you get a plaque and the plaques are being sent out now. Uh, I've already okay. got mine for, uh, for the, my speckled trout and also for some other fish I caught now, other species I caught last year. They're usually sent out, you know, they have to wait till the end of the year and they're usually sent out in, in February. And so most of them have already gone out. Okay. So it is a lag time. If you catch a you know trout in you know in winter time in February, you don't get your plaque until you know a year later. Gotcha. But that's the way nope. it works. Does it run fiscally? So is it like basically one October to thirty September, or is it annually? So one Jan to thirty December. It's annually now. It's okay. Annually now. Um, and of course, it abides by the regulations. They don't take any fish that are caught. Like striped bass are highly regulated, and they only have certain months that you can catch those. I see. You can't get a citation for. You can get a release, but you can't get a a kill citation for a fish that's illegal. So they have to be during the legal season. But Virginia doesn't have um, a a season on speckled trout. They just have um, not for recreational anyway. They do have a season of quota limit for for the commercial but not for the recreational now that what was interesting and again this is again going back to why and and kind of the thought process in terms of starting the speckled truth citation program is we want to capture the information just like again virginia's doing and so one of the things that they show is actually like these more or less bar graphs in terms of when the citations are actually caught and registered. Yes. And so you see a huge uptick. I mean, an incredible uptick in the late or, or I'm sorry, in the late summer, fall, all the way through the springtime. And so what that tells me is obviously there's tremendous productivity for catching speckled trout in that fishery. And so if you kind of grow that that a little bit more on a larger scale from Virginia all the way to Texas and you kind of group all that together, then you can might maybe see something a little bit more, you know, in terms of that trend analysis. Now, is that pretty consistent in terms of that productivity? Uh, so again, late summer, early fall, all the way through the spring, is that really y'all's big best trout seizing per se? Well, for for the the average layman that just goes out and fishes speckled trout occasionally, that is. But uh, I fish speckled trout twelve months of the year, and mm-hmm. I, have, you know, I have the opportunity to catch a you know large fish, yeah. a trophy fish, you know, twelve months of the year because I, and that's changed um, from you know for, till about from about ten or twelve years ago. Um, I've changed a lot of my fishing habits, and a lot of these fish people don't realize are staying here overwintering. Uh, a lot of them do. Uh, migrate down to Carolina, but mm-hmm. a lot of that, we have different subsets of groups and Virgi- uh, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science has said that they are different uh, um, DNA, you know, uh, there are different groups of speckled trout, even in Chesapeake Bay. And Interesting. some do overwinter here all winter. And uh, I've had a pretty good winter this winter. Now with it being us from my understanding, and, and I could see just through our own citation data, the volume of citations coming from Virginia, North Carolina. I mean, they've, they've basically far surpassed, probably doubled, maybe even tripled what has been uh, submitted in years past. But I also understand, you know, environmentally, I think y'all have had a couple of warm winters kind of back to back. Is that a huge play in terms of production? That, that Uh, is, that is the key to it. Uh, Okay. We've had, um, like in the 70s, we had all these big trophy fish in the 70s when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, mm-hmm. uh, you know, 74, 75, 76. And we had a huge freeze in 1970, the January of 78. The Chesapeake Bay 
completely froze over mm -hmm. from the headwaters all the way up into Pennsylvania, all the way down to Virginia Beach. I mean, we had the whole bay was froze over for a month. Holy crap. <laughs> go back and look at the graphs on the speckled trout catches um mm -hmm. after that winter it was three or four years before it was you know it might have been a thousand trout registered for citations you know i don't i'm, a, I'm just giving a yeah, yeah no i got you uh, you know in 70 uh, in 77 and then 78 it, it fell off the cliff um and uh that's now, what you said it take about three or four years to rebound no uh you know the trout we have, you know, we have the trout spawn in, you know, usually May, June, July, and maybe first week or so August. That's when they spawn in, you know, in Chesapeake Bay. And they grow so fast when they're, when they're young. I mean, a, a four month old trout can be nine inches, 10 inches. Mm -hmm. And then a, uh, a year later, that fish is almost a legal size, you know, 14 inch fish. And then the second year, Mm -hmm. second full year they can be up to 17 18 19 inch fish and so that's that's the way as they now as the years go uh, that's of course the more years they you know you get bigger i mean that's, mm -hmm. but uh now are y'all like a are y'all like a really river influenced like freshwater influenced fishery i mean do y'all have like a tremendous volume of fresh water that comes into your fishery in certain areas, uh, okay, we you know most of the time our bay is like uh, eighteen parts per million salinity. Uh, last year we had a lot of rain. This was year before last. We had a lot mm -hmm. of rain in, in southeast Virginia, um, and <clears throat> the salinity got down to eight parts per million. Um, okay, or before last, um, we've had average rainfall this you know this past fall, and this year uh, there is some influence uh, up in the headwaters of some of the rivers. Uh, but the speckled trout doesn't seem to mind even, you know, a seven, eight uh, parts per million salinity. Yeah. Uh, they don't have to have 18, 19 parts, which is a normal for the lower bay, maybe sometimes even 21 on, you know, dry summers. Now, do you feel like, though, that sal <clears throat> the salinity levels uh, or rather higher salinity levels play a bigger part in terms of targeting those bigger fish like you do? I'm not sure. Like I say, I, I've caught them in, you know, in low salinity, high salinity. Um, uh -huh. it, I, I don't think salinity, um, the getting back to these, you know, bad winters, you know, these, these cold stun events, um, that's what they, that's what, uh, the VIMS, uh, that's, that's the term they use cold stun because uh -huh. if you have, if you have two or three nights, it gets down to zero, you know, Fahrenheit and the water temperatures drop from, you know, um, the mid forties down to, to 38 or 39 degrees. Uh, 38 is, um, they've done some studies, I think in South Carolina, that's about the, the, the range of the war temperature that they start dying. Okay. For so, an extended period of time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For like two, you know, in two days, three days. Uh, okay. We, we had, uh, and that's what happened, you know, going back to the seven, uh, 70, the w winter of 78, uh, the January of 78, to kill all, you know, we had, if we hadn't have had that winter, you know, if we would have had, a, you know, a decent winter where you wouldn't have killed a lot of fish, you know, I, I would have said you would have, you know, average been some 10 and 12, 15 pound trout right along. My God. Um, so Virginia does have the, you know, it's, uh, does have, you have the opportunity of catching, you know, a, a once in a lifetime fish in Virginia. It's just not Florida, just not Texas or Louisiana. And I think that's the misnomer, at least for me, is like understanding like there are there are a lot of really big fish up in the Northeast. And if people didn't know that, they need to know that. And so, I mean, it's amazing how how productive in terms of big fish your fishery is up there, especially with that, you know, that climate. You know, I, I, I grew up in Louisiana. Right. And... I mean, I'm on the most fertile waters in the continental United States in terms of speckled trout, you know, and right. it's a pretty temperate uh, area, you know, in terms of we don't r see snow every, you know, once in a blue moon, we'll actually right. get right. super cold temps, you know, but um, what we don't see is obviously the volume of huge fish like you guys see up in the, in the Carolinas in Virginia. I mean, you guys are perpetually producing some really, really, I mean, truly world-class fish. 
That's correct. And, and Virginia is even, uh, we have a larger size fish than Carolina does, even, you know, our sister state right below us. Uh, Virginia overall has bigger fish. So why is that though? I mean, like uh, the, a fish South Carolina in the Charleston complex, and I think its state record is what, like 10 pounds, you well, know, and, and obviously Virginia's 16 pounds. I mean, is it, is it, is it tidal? Is it fresh water? Is it just the fishery itself? I mean, what, what do you think that is? Well, you know, they, they say that for species, the, you know, the, the, the farthest ranges, you generally have the bigger fish. Okay. And uh, that's, that's what I've always, you know, that's what I always heard. Um, the, the farther, and like I say, things might be changing with the climate. Um, you know, we never used to have uh, pelicans in the bay, and now we're having, having them stay here all, all winter, to winter mm-hmm. in the bay. I mean, you know, we've been, we haven't, I didn't see a pelican, pelican until about 20 years ago in the bay. Now they stay here and they're overwintering and even, even uh, producing. Uh, hmm. uh, but, I always heard the north, you know, for species, the farthest ranges, you generally have the larger fish. Um, and also the Chesapeake Bay is, is just a, uh, a nutrient. I mean, not nutrient, but it's, uh, it's, we have a lot of food here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the speckled trout that, that we have, you know, they, they feed on, of course, they're cannibals. They do feed on themselves. They, they will. <laughs> yeah, <eat>. absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, we have, we have a lot of menhaden in the bay. We have a lot of silver sides. We have a lot of half big ballyhoos. We have okay. a lot of mullet that's, that show up in the bay. A lot of mullet are further south, but they generally start showing up in Chesapeake Bay and in July and in the mm-hmm. warm, and they, they stay until uh, you know October usually. So there is a lot of food source here, and uh, and another one of that food source is is a blue crab, Chesapeake Bay blue crab. No kidding. Well, that I'd like to go back and tell you back in the seventies. How we used to how we used to catch big speckled trout. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Let's, Let's hear it. Read <laughs> into this. Almost all the big speckled trout caught in the seventies were caught on peeler crabs, and that's a blue crab that's getting ready to molt, or either soft shell crabs. I'm sure, sure. Yes, sir. That, that's a, we have we have a lot of eel grass and a lot of widgeon grass, um, in you know in the bay. And these crabs, that's a nursery for, for the smaller crabs. And these speckled trout, that's one of their main diets, uh, you know, in the spring. Before that's so crazy. Home. And back in the 70s, as when I was, you know, just a young, young guy, young kid and guy growing up, uh, we had all these big fish here. And what everybody would do, they would either get on the shoreline. Like I so said, you didn't have to have a boat. You could fish right from the bank. And when the, uh, when the tide was high in the afternoons, which would have been, you know, in the Chesapeake Bay, we have we have four tides a day, a, a, you know, a, a high and a low and a high and a low every six hours. Okay. So diurnal, yes, sir. And and we have about a two and a half foot uh, on average. And that's not that's not counting you know full moon and new moons when you have a lot of a lot of current, a lot of tide moving in. But on average, we have about a two and a half foot between low water and high water. And, okay. And during the moons, we have about a three foot. Most of the speckled trout um, that were Caught back those years, I would say ninety five percent were caught on dead bait, on peeler crabs. All those big fish we were caught that I caught back those years were caught on peeler crabs. And and when people would get off from work in the afternoons, the shorelines and the points, and some people would be in the boats, and some people would be on the shore and fishing right from the bank and waiting mm-hmm. for the tide to come in. Around you know the full moon in May, that was usually the peak, um, and and fish and just soaking these peeler crabs just with a, um, you know, straight, you know, with a, with a Eagle claw, you know, long shank full out hook with the whole half of a peeler crab and just toss it out and wait for them to come by and, and eat it. And oh my God. <laughs> that's, that was, uh, and about 90, it was about 1980, a friend of mine from Eastern shore, another Marine police officer of mine called me and told me, he said, we're catching a lot of speckled trout over here on the Eastern shore. And we're using lures. I said, uh, I said, well, I've never used lures for them. And I was about, uh, I was about nineteen or twenty then. And I'll tell this little story. I think it's pretty good for the for this podcast. Yeah. Uh, he told me to go buy a mural lure. And I said, I don't I never heard of them. So I went to a Kmart across in Newport News. You know, we live in the country out here in Lost. It wasn't even uh, it didn't have any stoplights back those years. And I went to Kmart and I found a TT11 mural lure. Uh-huh. And this was about 1980, 81. 
and I went to an old friend of mine. I kept my boat at his at his uh, at his house. He had a little boat house, and I came over a little creek there. And I said, "Let's go try." This was in September, and I went out uh, on a flat in about three or four foot of water, and we started fishing. We caught twenty speckled trout that afternoon. No huge ones, but nice, you know, 18 to 20, 22 inch fish, nice class fish on mural lures. And uh, mm-hmm. since, since then, I was hooked. I was just hooked. Um, so that's when you started kind of the artificial lure artificial. addiction, more, more or less. Yes, that's when I. Because you're artificial only now, is that correct, sir? I'm artificial only now. Uh, I have, you know, I've, I've fished peeler crabs, you know, for those years back then. But since mm-hmm. I got turned on the mural lures, I've, I've been strictly artificial. Uh, I did used to mix it up some when people told me they were catching them on live pig fish. We have, you know, same, some of you, we all use live croaker. I did use those every now and then back years ago and had good luck catching a few big fish with that. But uh, I just, I didn't really like, you know, fishing with a, a live bait under a cork. I, I like to feel the strike from a lure. Sure. And uh, and so artificial, uh, I've been strictly fishing artificials now for probably 25, 30 years. But the mirror lure starting it all and, and so that's interesting because mike mcbride again my mentor he wrote an article um back in the day i think it was called the forgotten and it basically talked about how you know these mirror lures and like the 52 m's and 7 right. m's and 5 m's i mean all these like vintage even probably some even more so right basically having such a huge impact on lore development today and then not only that just a production you know, volume back then. And so how they're nostalgic and how they're so key in terms of our fishing or saltwater inshore fishing lineage to targeting big fish on, on now artificial. I mean, I'm looking at a box in a, I'm in a room full of tackle that has every conceivable (laughs) profile, sink rate, ascent rate. I mean, you name it, but it started kind of with those pioneers in terms of the industry so that's super cool to kind of hear you talk about that especially on the very front end of it you know well i I was the first one to start using art like i say my friend the eastern short you know he turned me on to it and uh and within the first day like i say we went out that afternoon and got found some silver sides that were working a flat and we just Mm -hmm. we caught like 20 fish that day and i said this is a ticket i mean this was was just uh, phenomenal i mean this it just changed my whole way of fishing. And, you know, I didn't want to fish bait anymore since then. So the, your double digit fish, I mean, you, you caught, what'd you catch her on? I was caught on peeler crab. On a peeler crab. Okay. That was now your other, uh, the, the majority, the large majority of your 30 inch fish were all on peeler crabs or? No, um, I've caught, um, you know, I've caught some eight fourteens, uh, nine fives, nine twelves, um, you know, a lot of seven and a half eights um, over the years uh, on mm-hmm. all officials. My largest on barrel lure was about 31 inches, was, uh, was about 31 and a half, 32 inches. It was 814, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, over the years, we, uh, you know, caught a lot of sixes and sevens, a lot of 26, 27 yeah. inch fish. Now, aside from your lure, though, I mean, what, what else is in kind of your arsenal in terms of targeting these big fish? Um, I fish, uh, I fish a top water, um, badonka donk. I like interesting. The, uh, okay. I got we uh, some friends turned me on to those about ten years ago. Uh, it's a bomb made by Bomber Lures. Yeah. Uh, what? Why is that? Just profile or? Uh, I don't know. They you know Bomber kind of kind of pushed some lures. You know they kind of marketed uh, uh, Badonka Donk about you know twelve years ago, twelve or thirteen mm-hmm. years ago, and um, I started. And that's really when I got into more top water fishing and got in more into wade for wade fishing for them. I'd like to take a small break to sincerely thank our podcast sponsors. As you know, we're a brand about sharing the passion and pursuit of trophy speckled trout, as well as our conservation. Fortunately for us, Mirror Lore, Texas Custom Lures, and the original Custom Corky support that same passion, which is evident through the support of this podcast. Simply put, without these brands, none of this will be possible. And we're incredibly appreciative, and we hope you are too. Now, let's get back to the discussion. So you do a lot of wade fishing in Virginia for these big fish. I do. I, I have my personal boat is a 16 foot uh, 1996 uh, Hughes Lappy, which is an awesome little flats boat. I have a 70 uh, four stroke Yamaha. 
on it and uh and i use it to get to my locations and i you know i, I fish uh wade fish like with that mm-hmm. and i also drive to a lot of locations and just uh, just walk out i have permission you know from landowners homeowners and stuff private properties and i just walk out in uh and, and fish and wade yeah. fish. So a lot, and so you don't really have to have you know a nice hundred thousand dollar boat to catch trophy trout. If you have uh-huh. access to get to a point where you know fish are, you, you can you can still catch big fish. Whether you have a, you know five hundred dollar kayak or a hundred thousand dollar you know flats boat with a four hundred outboard on. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so. I always knew you were a good man, though, because, I mean, wade fishing is in, it's in my blood, especially growing up in, in southeast Louisiana, wade fishing in Barrier Islands. And and then I've obviously fished out of a boat as well. Uh, but really, wade fishing was part of our kind of my upbringing DNA in terms of my fishing DNA. But now, obviously, I'm in the land of wade fishing here in Texas. My oh, God. Right. You know, and but what's interesting, though, is I, I don't particularly – think of wade fishing in a Virginia, like if somebody's like, Hey, you're going to go wade fish for target or for trophy speckled trout. The probably the last place I would think to do that would be in the Virginia area. So that's interesting. It's, uh, it, it's just given, it's just taking, uh, taking my fishing to a new level. It's, uh, interesting. wade fishing is, is just something that I, it, it's my favorite way to catch them. Like I said, I have a nice little flats boat, um, that I sometimes I use to go to the areas I want to fish. Yeah, it's your taxi, right? That's what we would call our boat. It's a taxi. It gets me there, and I, then I do my thing. Um, and in Virginia, I I, I wait uh, I wait fish uh, on the tides. I'll fish uh, usually um, uh, mid on the mid ebb, uh, all the way through the low water. Of course, the, the bite usually slows down around the you know around the tide changes. Uh, you know, slack water. We don't generally get much of a bite, and then mm-hmm. the back on on the flood. I fish usually uh, when I'm wading. I fish the last three hours of the ebb and the first three hours of the flood. It depends if I don't have time. I'll just fish. You know, just the three hours of either side of the tide. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the tide's higher, I will be in the boat and fishing. You know, if I'm fishing all day in the boat. But getting back to the badonka dock, I'll tell you a little, little story about the badonk. Um, I fished the five, the four and three quarter inch, um, the big ones that are called the five inch. I fished the citrus color, and I started winning some tournaments with that lure. And it, I just that's my that's my go to lure now when I'm waiting. Uh, that's my I will ninety percent of the time I will have that the top water on. And uh, I've caught you know in the last ten years you know a lot of twenty eight, twenty nines, some thirty, thirty ones with that with that bait. No, no, why that color? Is it just? Uh, well, I was using different colors. I was using the uh, the redfish one, and then there was one with a hot pink, you know, head on it, and I was using that. And I caught fish on the other ones. Um, the, the citrus, I just started catching more, and um, I don't change the hooks out, but I do put a little bling on the trailing hook, um, a little uh, little chartreuse with uh, with some bling on, and mixed in with it. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> not, a, not a lot. I, I do, I, and I. You know, field test them over the years, and, I, and the bling uh, I think adds to the action. I get more more uh, blow ups with the with the bling on it. Uh, so now, now, t- now bling uh, it, is a feather treble. Is it like feather, uh, treble. it's okay, yeah. okay? I don't change the hooks out. I just add the, fe- uh, the feather to the uh, to the, uh, the rear hook on the badonk. Um, I, I I got so in love with this with this lure. You know, people get confidence in lures, and that's what you're gonna throw. And, uh, uh, but Barmer ha- actually had a closeout on them. It's been about 10 years ago. And I bought 150 of them for $2.69. <laughs> Dang it. But, I wish I'd have known about that. <laughs> I, I'm notorious for that. That's why my, my kind of our, our room and kind of where I'm recording this podcast. I mean, it looks like tackle warehouse in here. And it's because <laughs> like when Corky's going sale, um, and my wife's actually in the other room, so she's listening to this, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> but when those corkies go on sale for a dollar ninety nine a pop or something like that, right. I don't buy one or two. It's the whole peg and typically right. two or three pegs, right? So right. that's why when people are like, How many corkies do you have? I'm like, dude, just don't worry about it. But uh <laughs> that's funny. I'm what? actually looking up the the citrus color right now while you're talking. Okay. And so yeah, so keep going. Um, I mean, in fact, Bomber doesn't even make that size anymore in the, uh, from the, in the four and three quarter. They, I think they only make it in the four inch now. 
Now, I, I do like uh, the mirror lure she dogs. Uh, I've caught quite many trout on top water with that bait. But I, 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 my go-to on top water when I'm wading is my citrus uh, four and three quarter inch, and that's and I like the low pitch one, not the high pitch. Okay, interesting. Now, so uh, I don't see a citrus uh, more or less color. What it says, it actually is it like a it's almost like a green back with a chartreuse belly chartreuse and yellow. It's like three colors yep. on it. Uh, yep, yep. Okay, so they still make it. It's out there. So. Bomber, you're you're welcome there. <laughs> There's probably gonna be a ton of people buying that lore, but uh, that's in. All right, so so you talked about you know top water being in the arsenal. Now mirror lore, obviously you still throw those. Is there a certain style of lore, or type of lore? Yes. Okay. My, my go-to big bait uh, lure is the Catch Five. Uh, it's a series three Catch Five, and I like the eight oh eight color. The eight oh eight. Yeah, Halloween. Even, even when I'm throwing the TT, I throw the TT eight oh eight or the TTR eight oh eight rattler. Uh, eight oh eight is probably um, I've caught more uh, more trout and more bigger trout, la- larger trout on the eight oh eight color than any color that Merrill Lure makes. It, it's so in, it's so ridiculous that that color that Halloween color. Halloween. Is- that's right. Regardless of fishery, South Texas, all the way, it sounds like obviously in Virginia, but I've caught too many fish in, in Florida on them, even in clear water. I mean, that 808 is just ridiculous. And and it, it, it works whether it's, you know, even this citrus, uh, Merrill Lure, you know, I don't think the color is is as much, uh, the color does, does count some, but I think presentation, you know, fishing a lure properly is how you catch your fish. Mm-hmm. You know, I walk the dog with my badonk, and I do change it up every now and then. Sometimes I'll speed it up. Sometimes I'll slow it down. And uh, what, what I'm seeing, though, though, is through the first two lures that you've given me is body profile. They they have very similar body profile, and it's kind of like more that Menhaden pogeyish type profile. Is that something that that's done kind of with uh, precision, or is that something that you just you just like that profile? I just like that profile, you know. I, I you know, I've, I've I've fished a lot of different color mirror lures, and I've catched them on hot pink. I catch them on uh, on chartreuse. Yeah. TTCH. Uh, I use that in Lynn Haven, which has a lot of sand bottom there, and in, in the, you know, in the late fall when the water gets real clear. Uh, mm-hmm. I like hot pink colors also. Hot pink is a very good color. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, I'm not even change. I'm, I don't. Some days I don't change my. I don't. I, don't, I keep the same lure on, and. Uh, because you, you get confidence in a bait, uh, and that's that's what you're going to throw, you know. And well, I, it sounds like you know, and again, kind of, I've always, uh, again, I just look up to him so much. But Mike McBride, I mean, he basically says, if you know the when and where, you can catch them on a big pin. And it sounds like over right. the course of time, I mean, you've so, you've dialed in the when and where right. to a T. And so now, you know, throwing and you have your confidence lures, but you know how to fish them right and and they give the fish ability to your approach, you know, but you, the, the other 90% of knowing the when and where you've over decades of experience, it sounds like you've obviously dialed that into a T. Well, I, I have, you know, like I say, I've been on the water all my life and worked on the mm-hmm. water with VMRC for, you know, 33 years and retired from them. And, uh, and, uh, Learning, the, you know, I, I approach big trout just like a, a, a hunter will approach a, you know, a big white-tailed deer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I learn the area. I go in, I, and I've already been scouting the grass beds, you know, the last couple of weeks because you know, the fish will be moving in. We've had a mile one. Uh, usually it starts May 1, but I think any day now we're going to get some fish yeah. moving in to some of these shallows. When the water, usually the water temperature gets about 60, it, it turns on, you know, in, uh, in the bay. Mm-hmm. But I catch them all winter. Like I've had, you know, good luck all winter up in uh, the headwaters of some of the rivers and up in the creeks. Um, I took Captain Bill Puschewski and uh, another friend in the Karadaman, which is off the Rappahannock River, which is even north of me, uh, three mm-hmm. weeks ago. And we caught uh, we caught 13 trout and four big stripers. I mean, four, uh, 10 stripers up to 10, uh, 10 pounds, eight, 10 pound stripers. And we had uh, two citation trout uh, that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, Captain, Captain, six seven pounders like 27 inches yeah, and... 26 and a half and a 24 release which uh, okay. made we, we released the bigger ones we only kept five fish or five trout of the 13 we released and tagged we tagged them uh, the okay. fish tagging program also 
we tag fish and uh, and uh, and that's part of that program. But uh, you you do a lot of fish tagging, so I, that's something I didn't know. So you do a lot of fish tagging, and and I, I didn't even know Virginia had a tagging program. We do have a tagging program. Um, I was very instrumental in the tagging program years ago, and I'm not actually tagging anymore. A friend of mine that was with me that day is still uh, very active in tagging fish, and he he tagged them that day. I tagged for about five years mm-hmm. and I got, so I didn't like it because we had a lot of guys that were, were catching them on the piers and at some of these outflows and they were catching these little, you know, little 10 and 11 inch trout and putting tags on them. And I just didn't think it was, you know, these little, these little trout that only two or three months old sticking a tag was, was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. So, um, <clears throat> I kind of bowed out of the tagging program, but my friend with me that day was tagging. Okay. And it, yeah, it, it is a good program. I just disagree with tagging, you know, these nine, eight, nine inch fish that are three or four months old, you know, putting a spaghetti tag in the side of, you know, sure. side under his dorsal does not, I don't think it's so. So but, actually I talked to Rad, uh, not Rad Trasher. Um, I'm trying to think from CC Alabama. My dad's obviously huge in, in, in the tag Louisiana. Pro- it's going to come to me his name uh, in the tag Louisiana program. And so what we were talking about is actually, throughout the course of my dad's tagging venture is that those fish may actually shed the tag. So even if you do tag them at such a young age, even if that fish does grow to, let's say 16, 18, 20 inches, chances are when that fish is actually recaptured, he's already shed that tag. Shed that tag, right, right. Do, do you feel like that's that's probably some value or, or um, that's pretty it, true? I've never heard that, but I, I, that makes sense to me. You know, as they grow, I mean, you, you know, you yeah. get, you know, it's a dart tag. Um, right. A spaghetti dart tag and uh and the reason I, that i kind of brought that up was because my dad you know he's tagged a twelve thousand trout in four years and never has he once had a trout that was caught from a previous year so like let's say he's tagged three thousand trout three years ago of those three thousand trout now he'll have you know 90 to 110 recaptures that year on those fish so you right. would think okay with that level of rate and that volume of tags that is going into the estuary year after year you'd think like two or three years later you'd catch one of those fish that was tagged a couple years ago and that's never happened and so there's either one of two things one the entire year class has been wiped out harvested eaten whatever or yeah those fish are just shedding those tags and so i don't know that's i just bring that up so yeah it it makes sense i mean i'm I'm sure that probably does occur um Virginia, we do get some returns on tags. Uh, we, we've had some fish that would, uh, and, and it's amazing how fast they can travel when they move out of here. When some of the ones that do migrate south, uh, we've had some fish go all the way to South Carolina, wow. uh, Atlantic Beach, North Carolina, from you know from up to Chesapeake Bay. You know that's probably 140, 50 miles. You know in just several weeks. <laughs> so now, now do so you know when you created or helped create kind of that tagging program, was that something y'all had kind of thought about in terms of, okay, this is why we want to have this program is to see the the movement of fish. Like what, what was that thought process there creating that program? Well, the Virginia game fish tagging program, I think it's, I think it started about, um, I'd say it's probably about 16, 18 years now. And they're tagging other species too. They're taking, you know, red drum, uh, striped bass, and di- different species. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it comes through the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, um, which is uh, part of the, College of William and Mary now in, in Virginia. Um, in Gloucester County, that's that's their home base is the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. So they have a lot of big research vessels and things, but they're, they're the ones that kind of uh, you know, control the tagging program. And yeah. it started with a few of the scientists down there. Um, but it, they, I mean, was, they kind so of just the track fish movement or what? Yes, track fish movement. That's right. And uh, we've also done there have been since 2012, since the real bad freeze of 2012, um, we tried to wanted to do some uh, tracking with hydrophones, you know, fish in these estuaries to see if where they were moving to during the winter. Um, I don't know what the data, I think the, the grant money kind of ran out. I don't know what the data ever showed on that. Interesting. Now I want to get back to kind of your tart, your, the way in which you target those big fish. So we talked about, you know, top waters talked about some slow sinks, catch five being one of your favorites in that 808. Do you throw like any soft plastics or do you have a soft plastic of choice or? I do. I fish bass assassins, uh, you know, 
ounce lead head, you know, five inch jerk baits. I uh, like the, uh, you know, the, like hard jerk baits or lip jerk soft, baits or soft, soft jerk baits. Okay. Gotcha. The five, the five inch, uh, bass assassins, mm-hmm. uh, captain bill. I'm going to put this in here. Captain bill Pushchevsky. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. Texas legend, right? Texas legend. That's right. Uh, he was inducted into the saltwater legends hall of fame in 2018. He and I are the same age. Uh, he he uh, chartered Texas in Matagorda Bay for many years, 30, 35 years. And he had a ladder accident several years ago, three, four or five years ago. And uh, he moved up into uh, to West Point, New York. His wife uh, got a big job with the government there. And he moved mm-hmm. to Texas and he was injured from a fall, ladder fall in his garage. And it really put him out of business. And he's moved to... Uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, about an hour and a half from me. And he started fishing with me last fall. In fact, he was fishing with me three weeks ago when we fished up in the Caratoma. And uh, he, he loves the, uh, he loves the soft plastic. He likes the, uh, the bass assassins. And uh, I use them too. And usually in deeper water, more current, uh, I'll fish those uh, around some of the bridges and some of the inlets uh, in Lynn Haven and places, uh, usually in deeper water, you know, seven to eight, nine foot of water. Now, what are the chances, though, that like two legends, a Virginia and a Texas legend, get together? <laughs> now, are, are those trout don't stand a chance, man. That's crazy. Well, he's asked. He's asked me. He said, "Keith, I want you to start." Fit, you know, of course, he he doesn't have the local knowledge of the water I have here. Yeah. You know, he but he's gone and bought a little Boston Whaler uh, seventeen Montauk for this year, and uh, he's going to be. Uh, be uh, leaving it at uh, dry storage here in, in Gloucester and be fishing. And I'm going to show him, you know, the area. And uh, we, we swap a lot of stories. We fished uh, probably five times since the fall in full days. And we've, we've had great luck every time we've been. He's okay. learned from me and I've learned from him. But um, he wants to fish uh, some tournaments we have here. And I told him, I said, Bill, I said, we don't have tournaments like y'all do, you know, like the uh, – yeah, in Texas. In Texas, I mean, we don't. We just have you know small tournaments. Sometimes twenty five or thirty people. Little, uh, <laughs> little tackle stores might get a tournament up, you know, for yeah. a tournament. We might have some tournaments that last a month, but we don't have any big money tournaments like you know Tide, like the uh, CCA does or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, they have the Legends Series down here, which is obviously was inducted in. So that's right. Yeah, but that's huge. I mean, you're talking obviously. But even then, though, that's honestly just scary for all the other anglers potentially listening to this. If you see Keith Nuttall and, and Captain Bill kind of um, registered, oh, that's going to be a tough one. Uh, so I feel bad for those guys. But no. All right. So I, I ask this kind of a lot it, just because I feel like there's some value and there's some importance to it. But do you do you put a lot of stock in like moon phase and so lunar and, and things of that nature? That's a great question. Um, I did years ago, mm-hmm. and then I, you know, then I started catching a lot of fish on the the worst salooner days of the month. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when it was said, you know, zero fish days for the day. You know, yeah. still try whatever. Um, I um, uh, I've had some some of my best days have been, you know, uh, the, when the salooner table when it was just you know mid mid moons, right? Uh, you know, very very. Uh, very, yeah, just not ideal days, right? Yeah, not ideal days, and they've been some of my best days. And you know, mm-hmm. just know more about top water. People think you catch, you know, you catch your top water trout at daybreak. Um, I caught my biggest fish really on uh, in the middle of the day, uh, bright sunshine, bluebird days. And mm-hmm. yeah, I do like I do like cloudy, overcast days. That's if I would choose, I would pick cloudy, overcast. You know, rainy between showers or whatever. I would yeah. pick those days my wade fishing for targeting big fish. But I have caught just as many big fish at, you know, at noon with a bluebird day, not a cloud in the sky with, you know, uh, do you feel, yeah. So, I mean, do you feel though that, especially up there with some extremity, you know, I mean, you guys have some weather extremes. Yes. Do you feel like maybe that those fish that would have fed on that, high day of so lunar activity maybe there was a hard front rolling through and maybe there's some stabilization in terms of barometric pressure and, and environmental conditions water clarity etc days after that even though it's not necessarily a particularly highly rated so lunar day those fish have just kind of weathered the storm per se 
for a couple of days and now that it's kind of gotten right they're just chewing right chewing. do you feel like there's some there's something some value to that yes i do i, I feel there's okay. some value to that um so don't just like target high so lunar days instead no, definitely obviously not. fish around that know what it's going on but don't put tremendous stock in that uh, I don't. I tell people just to go. You know, you, you pay your dues, you'll get rewarded after a while. You know, and and I'm the I'm I'm honest with people. I'm in my age now. I don't I don't tell a lot of you know I don't tell a lot of I don't exaggerate and I just tell people the way it is. And uh, uh, you, you just got to go and and put your time in. I have a lot of days that I don't catch anything. You know, but I'm still enjoying it. I mean, it's uh, you know it's it's not always catching it's, 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 uh, you know, it's fishing and, and just being out and, uh, and enjoying everything about it. And the reason I really love wade fishing so much is that you just learn, you just learn so much about the bottom, you know, you, mm-hmm. I'm, these bars and sloughs, we call, you know, troughs or slough, we call them sloughs. We have mm-hmm. sand bars, you know, I might be in a foot of water walking down a slam bar and a slough that might be three foot deep, you know, near low water. And I'll throw parallel, you know, down that edge of that bar on that on that slope. You know, all fish like edges. You know, whether whatever kind of edge they like edges, and and I'll I'll cast and uh, and and nail him. And that, it's just it's just, I mean, it's, it, it's nothing. I, I hear you kind of getting pumped up yeah, talking about it. Up. You know, I, I mean, I hear the passion that you have for this sport. Right, right, right now. I mean, I, I can I when you're talking. I hear you visualizing exactly what you're trying to kind of tell me. Right. Right. But I understand yeah. like just the passion behind it and, and wanting to get it like, dude, honestly, I'm fired up. I want to go right now, you know, because I, I know what you're talking about. I have areas that I, I know are similar, you right. know, and obviously being this time of year, but that's, it's, a, it's awesome to hear that because a guy who um, is more mature, right and has been around for a little bit longer, still having that zeal, still having that same passion, a guy who's had tremendous production, you know, double digit fish, two, two dozen over, uh, 30 inches, you know I mean? And still having that passion to continue to go out. I mean, what, what keeps you motivated? I mean, what, why is that? Um, I don't know. Like I said, I, I, I never played sports in school. It's just, it's like I told you when I first started this podcast, it's, um, it's just, I got salt in, salt water in my veins. I just, I just love being out on the water. You know, I worked on it, you know, you know, uh, we worked shift work when I worked VMRC on a patrol boat. We had, I had small boats also. We ran small boats in some of the creeks and rivers and, but I ran a 31 Bertram, but I'd go to work and come home and go fishing. You know, I'd stay on the water all day and still go back, you know, and, and fish. And, uh, and I fish with a lot of different other species too. I cobia fish and red drum, but yeah. speckled trout is my that that is my passion. My wife said if I pursued speckled pursued her like speckled trout, I married would be a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> I can empathize with that. But I mean, you've done every conceivable thing, you know, that most anglers would love to do. I mean, you're a legend in in that in that area, right? I mean, you've ex, you've gotten to that 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 level, that stature where people look at you in that regard, when you, when you speak, people listen because of the, the volume of production that you've had. And so, you know, most people you'd think like, man, I'm just, okay, I've done it, you know, but you still have that. I guess that's why Tom Brady's still in the friggin' NFL. We won't retire. Right. Or Drew Brees and, and those guys, right. Is I don't know what they have left to prove. They have every conceivable record. They have rings and all these other things. Like what is like, it just keeps you motivated to d- continue to do that, you know? So I just want to ask you that question. Just that one big blow up. You know, I, I, I live for that big blow up on top water. Um, and, and another thing I'll say about lures, you know, I think you catch your biggest fish on top waters. Um, of course you can catch them on your other suspended baits, mm-hmm. you know, but I, but the top water for me has produced my largest fish in the last 10 years. And do you fish them seasonally though? Do you fish them all year? No, not, I don't, fi- I fish seasonally. Uh, like I say, when uh, the water, in the winter time, I'm fishing my suspending baits. Um, I'll start fishing top water about the month of May in about a okay. month, three or four weeks. And I'll fish top waters right on through till about the first of first frost. We usually get in October when the water temperature okay. gets, gets, you know, down in the fifties, I'll, I'll stop fishing top waters. It seems like they don't respond much, you know, after that. Okay. So that's when you kind of switch back over to catch five. Do you cook, do you throw any quirky fat boys or anything like that? 
I've got some. I, I haven't. I haven't really uh, ever gotten into uh, throwing those. Uh, uh-huh. My catch five eight oh eight has produced you know so many big <laughs> trout. You know, I, yeah. I say you get your confidence and you know it works. Don't you know why fix it? Um, sure, that's <laughs> that's fair enough. I mean, it, it, this is crazy. This is such a good discussion. But uh, Mr. Keith, we're we're at a at our time. But I did want to ask you a few more questions. Uh, so you were talking about it. You have everything. So uh, I guess in short, I'm, I'm looking to kind of wrap up the show, but I want to ask you a few questions before I do that. Okay. And the first is, um, with everything that you've done, um, you know, do you feel like the, the state record will ever be broken of 16 pounds? I mean, it's, I, I do. I think it's a very good chance that the 16 pound state record could be broken. If we have, if we have three or four more mile winners, I think mm-hmm. you might see some of those 15, 16 pound fish again in, in Virginia. I really do. Uh, it's all based on, on the winter. If we have a huge kill, then, uh, you know, yeah. all that's aside, but you know, the way that the, the climate is going, uh, I think Virginia could be, you know, you, it's a very good chance to, to beat that world record. That's, um, that was taken from Virginia by, by Florida. Uh, I got you. Yeah. So the seventeen seven Craig Carson, you know, y'all had that for many, many years. Yes. You think it'll come back, right? I do. I, I really do. I think it's a very good chance. And it's all based on, you know, the, the, the premise that we have mild winters, that mm-hmm. we don't have, you know, a lot of cold stun kill. Uh, now, do you feel like fishing pressure may hinder that in any way? Not really. Um, you know, the Chesapeake Bay, we, we in my, even in Mob Jack Bay, I can always get away from people. It's not like people are all on top of you every day. You know, of course, everybody yeah. knows my boat. You know, they try to get around me and, you know, where I'm going and know where I'm at. And and I have friends that I, you know, uh, a little syndicate that we talk, you know, you know, how'd you catch up there today? Or where'd you, you know, we, we talk a lot. Uh, but we have a lot of area. The Mob Jack Bay and Chesapeake Bay, and as, as a – Year goes on, the summer goes on. I go up to the northern neck and fish some of the mouths of some of the creeks, you know, further north. I mean, as a, as the summer gets in, you know, summer um, gets real hot. They move a little further north. Mm-hmm. Um, a few other things I like to like to say about when I'm fishing, and I think the uh, the audience might like this, is that mm-hmm. I'm always I'm like a you know like a deer hunter. He's always you got to know your area, know your bottom. Know where your sloughs and know where your bars and know where your ocean beds are, or whatever. And and you become intimate with that area and you know the fish and you can know where, when they show up. But I also look for uh, you know I look for for bait. I look for bait uh, jumping. Mm-hmm. Almost all my big fish have been caught when I see you know fish uh, scurrying across the water like these half big ballyhoos. Um, uh, when they start uh, you know skipping across the water, you know that something's on them in the day. And going, getting back to 2012, I, I told you about uh, that was the last big year before we started having freezes in 19 and eight years ago. I had like 20 citations that year, and I had, uh, had I caught one day I caught five trout that were from 25 to 31 inches in 30 minutes. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and they were half big ballyhoos being just scattered, they were just skipping across the water like flying fish. And and I caught them all on the on the citrus top water. Um, oh my God! And that that will never I'll never do that. That's that's a once in a lifetime. That's even something more than a, you know catching a ten pounder. That's something that's you know almost unheard of to catch five citation fish in thirty minutes. Now is that your quote unquote like biggest stringer? Like if you had to if you had to total up your best day five fish stringer, what would that be? That, that would have been that day for sure. But I, okay. I've, had, I've had hundred fish trout days. I've caught you know hundred fish, you know, days. Yeah, 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 but I'm saying like the best five in terms oh, of weight yeah, size. Yeah. It'd be what, like a thirty six, maybe forty pound stringer or something like that? No about no doubt about it. Um yeah, those five fish were probably um, you know, from five and a half to nine pounds, nine and a half. And we had a couple twenty nines in there. That that was yeah, that was now your best five fish out of your entire career, what is that in terms of like a weight? What does that look like? I mean, would that be 50 pounds close to uh, it? Yeah, I'd say 48, 49 pounds. God yes. bless America. Yeah. 49 pounds. Yeah. Golly. Do you have any, like any mounts in your house? 
Do you, I do. You know? I have, uh, I, I, of course, back years ago, we didn't mount them in the 70s. You know, that's when we had the huge fish here. You know, I was young. We didn't even have enough money to all always <laughs> survive, yeah. much less get yes, fish. I have the 814 that I caught, the first biggest one I caught on a mural lure, and I caught mm-hmm. that one the TT26 um, in about two and a half foot of water. Now, um, if you had to choose a month, um, if you had to choose like a month out of the 12 in the year okay. to go target a big fish in your complex, what month would that be? If you had asked me that 10 years ago, I would have said the month of May. If mm-hmm. you ask me now, I would say um, post-spawn fish. As far as length, I would say August, August, September. Okay. Wow. Okay. August, September. If I was but for length now, but if you're going for, for weight with, you know, with the fish that are full of roe, you know, and, yeah. you know, a, a 10 pound fish in May will only probably weigh eight pounds, you know, in mm-hmm. July and August, you know, once they spawn out, you know, they're run down, they haven't fed a lot, you know, they're busy just using so much energy, you know, spawning. Uh, gotcha. I would say, I would say if, if you want to come and catch a trophy fish for length, it would be the month of August. Interesting. Why, August. Now, why is that? I mean, that's August, September. Um, because like I say, I, that those, those five fish are caught in 2012. That was in August. Um, and they, and, and another misnomer is that people think you only, when you catch big trout, they're loners. And that's not true. Uh, I, you know, that proved that day that big fish were traveling together. They were all, you know, working a pot of bait. And, you know, I caught them all within, you know, a, a 30 square foot, you know, 40, 40, di- 40 foot diameter. Okay. Every one of them. In 30 minutes, I mean, I was caught one. Then I make another cast, hits another one. We get him in, and um, yeah, that's cr- now. I mean, I've had actually my my best day was last year in East Matagorda Bay with my friend Ian Bellevue, and that was my best day in terms of five fish stringer, where it was a little over 36 pounds. Right. Um, obviously released them all, but right. in terms of length, weight, and stuff like that, it's just ridiculous. But yeah, I mean, we just kind of stayed on a stretch and and just. It was big, fat, big fish after big fish. I mean, there was nothing small in that. So I think that lends true to, you know, those fish are not always just isolated and kind of loners. Now, do you feel like there are characteristics though that, yeah, some more often than not, they are that way? Yes, where I, I do. Yeah. I th- okay. I think, I think in uh, in May when they come into spawn, I think they're more loners then. I think they're okay. And during the winter, uh, you know, we'll catch them in the winter and we'll catch, you know, some nice, you know, 23, 24 inch fish. And then every now and then you catch, you know, mixed in with the pod, you know, 28, 29 inch uh, during the winter months. Yeah. Now, last question. So, um, especially now you fish cat, but like, what, describe your fishing setup. Like, what are you throwing? I, equipment wise i'm sorry i, I throw um custom spinning ro- uh, spinning rods custom made rods I have like okay. six or or seven foot um most of mine are six six i i like shimano uh spinning reels um mm-hmm. captain bill throws shimano bait casters and his mm-hmm. rod mostly five five <laughs> five six i mean uh captain that's interesting bill, so he's totally opposite from me um that's a really short rod I'm not getting any backlashes and I, and, uh, I use braid. I use, I load it with 15 pound, uh, braid. Um, okay. And, and some of the braids I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really got, uh, really trying to figure out which ones are the best for wind knots. Cause I, I don't generally get wind knots with my big heavy top water, you know, but if I'm mm-hmm. lighter baits, you know, if I'm going down to Miradines or mural lures every now and you'll get a wind knot and yeah. of course nobody likes wind knots. No, <laughs> one especially if you do have a heavy plug on, right. that puppy's gone when you do get a wind knot. Um, I've 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 exper- or I've experimented with a lot of different braids, and I don't know if you've used it, but I've I've always found that the Suffolk Eight Thirty Two has always been the most consistent. I don't hardly have any uh, wind knots whatsoever, and I've used them all: fins, Ardent, Power Pro, Power Pro, Pro Super Slick. I mean, a Daiwa J braid, that yeah. vicious like braid. You like the J braid, or you like the suffix better? I like the suffix. The eight thirty two is money. I use the twenty pound, six pound diameter, yep. and that I, I can honestly say I have I have them on every single rod. No, I I, and and I've, I'm done experimenting. Yep. If there's a sale on on another braid brand, I don't care right. because it's suffix eight thirty two. I don't know, so I just throw that out there. 
and I like to tell your listeners to always, you know, be on top of your tackle. You always be on your, you know, top with your mm-hmm. lead. I'll, I'll use a, I actually don't, uh, don't use a uni knot. I don't, you know, I tie, uh, I use uh, fluorocarbon leaders. Captain Bill doesn't believe in fluorocarbon. He says you, you're spending money for something you don't need. But I use uh, usually a, a 15 to 20 pound fluorocarbon leader, and I'm using usually 15 pound braid. Now you use a double uni or to connect that or no? No, I don't. Uh, I use a little barrel swivel, a uh, spro barrel swivel. Uh, and I use about an 18 to 20 inch uh, leader from my bro- from my, my braid to my swivel. You know, one the little barrel swivels, the tiny yeah. to go with, and I tie my lure from that. Interesting. And with my top water, I'd go, generally go to a 20 pound test because it uh, I don't get where it tangles in the you know in the hooks when you make a cast and the wind gets into it. I use like a 20 pound leader for my top waters, but my suspending base I usually use like a 15 pound. Very cool. Yes, wow. Sir. Mr. Keith, yes, this sir. has been an awesome episode. Like, so I keep telling people like, this is season one of the Speckle Truth podcast. And, and, uh, the idea is to do these kind of, you know, at least in a long term year after year and right. And have seasons. And so I've had some other legends in a game, you know, like Jay Watkins and McBride and Doc Bob Weiss, and we're, we're going to have many others. And so the idea is obviously as we continue this year to year, I'd love to have you on again at to continue to talk to you because look, we didn't even scratch the surface That's with right. regards to maybe specifically dialing in how you look for a certain area or things of that nature. Right. And so yeah. if you're willing, sir, and I hate to put you on the spot, but would yeah. you, sure. would you like to be on the episode? I can talk trout all day. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Me too. Oh my goodness. Well, Mr. Keith, I really appreciate it, sir. Thanks uh, for kind of sticking with me. I know we were trying to dial in a date and a time and this, that, and the other thing. Thanks to Josiah or yes, Josiah. Yeah. He, he's obviously helping on your end with, with some of the equipment. So really appreciate his support. You're certainly uh, there, but you, you're thanks not, again, you're sir. Yeah. Right. What's that, sir? You're not recording now, right? I mean, you. I am. <laughs> I'm going I'm to finish it up right here. So I'm actually going to, I want to leave that in there because that's good stuff. Okay. But no, I want to hey say thanks to all the, the different listeners out there. If you've stuck with us, I think we're a little at an hour, maybe a little bit over an hour. This is a great podcast. And so I want to say thank you for all the listeners out there. Uh, just continuing to kind of stay with us. And I know it's been difficult um, with getting these out there, especially with our folks that have been participating in the podcast, it's hard for me to get to a couple of different areas and get those just because of the coronavirus and travel restrictions. I'm locked down here in San Antonio. I can't even go to the coast just because I need my first general officer or senior uh, or SCS in the chain of command to even travel. So my point is it's a little bit difficult, but we're getting through it and we're going to continue to get through it. So thanks for sticking with us. And until next time, guys, tight lines, God bless. And just remember, take what you need and release the rest. God bless.